Hi, I'm Thinks Too Much, and today we're going to be taking a look at the Resistance series and how it explores the themes of colonization through the lens of H.G. Wells' classic novel, The War of the Worlds. We're going to be taking a look at each of the three main games individually and see how each one tackles the themes of colonization. With that said, let's take a closer look. In 1898, H.G. Wells wrote The War of the Worlds, a novel that is arguably his magnum opus in his already impressive library of classic sci-fi novels. H.G. Wells is considered by many to be the grandfather of modern sci-fi. His novel, The War of the Worlds, might read like a run-in-the-mill alien invasion story today, but back in 1898, it was one of the first real narratives of how a realistic alien invasion would look like and humanity's utter incompetence to deal with such an event. I read The War of the Worlds in preparation for this video, and I was surprised how H.G. Wells' story is still very vivid, easy to read, and terrifying even 124 years after it was first published. The reason I'm bringing up H.G. Wells' classic novel is because, as I was playing the entirety of the Resistance series, at various points I kept telling myself, you know, this is kind of like Call of Duty, War of the Worlds, if such a thing existed. Most of us know the War of the Worlds through Spielberg's 2005 film adaptation starring Tom Cruise, but playing the Resistance games inspired me to actually read the original source material, and I was pleasantly surprised how the games follow in the themes H.G. Wells was willing to explore in his original novel, such as colonization and social Darwinism, which was very progressive for 1898. The games even expand on the sub-themes of colonization to include things such as loss, protection, and recovery. It might not seem like it at first, but the Resistance series and the War of the Worlds have a lot in common through their real-life inspirations. The first game, Resistance Fall of Man is the one that more closely follows in the themes and narrative flow of the War of the Worlds. Before the game starts, you are given a narration of how the Chimera, a hostile alien race, somehow appeared out of nowhere in Russia sometime in 1908. The Chimera were able to infect and convert the people they came in contact with and turn them into foot soldiers and other bigger alien monstrosities. While the Chimera were able to be contained in Russia for some time, by 1949, the Chimera's superior technology and numbers were able to destroy human defenses and completely overtake Europe. World War II never happened. Instead, the game takes place in 1951 and the United Kingdom is about to fall to the Chimera. Even though the US has taken a neutral stance on the conflict, it does send secret specialized forces to fight against the Chimeran invasion as the US knows that if the UK falls, the US might be next. This stance of US neutrality in the game is actually a nod to the real-life neutral stance the US had during Hitler's invasion of Europe. Yes, the Americans were sympathetic to the plight of Europe, but in the end, it was a foreign war, and that stance did not change until the Japanese Empire bombed Pearl Harbor. Similarly, while the Chimera are taking all of Europe, in the end, it's a foreign war, and I love how the game gets into the politics of an alien invasion even if it's just briefly. You play as Nathan Hale, one of the specialized US soldiers sent to help the British to repel the Chimeran assault, and a protagonist that barely speaks one paragraph of dialogue throughout the whole game. But Hale is like many other silent protagonists in action games from the mid-2000s. What's important is what's happening around the character, and not the character himself. The situation looks grim from the start. The American forces sent to assist the British are decimated by the Chimera as their superior technology is evident early on. Hale himself is infected by a Chimeran virus, but it actually renders him somewhat immune to this alien virus, even when it kills his entire squad. With this virus now flowing through his veins, Hale can regenerate his health and do all the badass things that a lone soldier does in these types of games. However, Rather than make Hale a badass because he is now somewhat immune to the Chimeran virus, his infection shows just how unprepared and vulnerable humanity is to deal with the Chimeran invasion. The Chimera deploy pods that are shot like mortars or bombs, but rather than explode, they release thousands of small alien-like insects that infect and paralyze their victims. 
after which the Chimera used transports that resemble the tripods from the War of the Worlds to collect their victims and be transported to conversion centers to be turned into Chimera. It's a really fucked up process to say the least, and it explores the feeling of helplessness as the Chimera are seemingly unstoppable, which was also echoed in similar ways on how the Martians are viewed in The War of the Worlds. H.G. Wells made it a point in his novel that the aliens have superior technology and firepower against anything that even the real-life British Empire had back in 1898. During that time, the UK was still riding high when it came to its imperial and colonial power. So the idea of this superpower being humbled by beings from another world was both exciting and horrifying. In the War of the Worlds, it's not firepower or technology that saves humanity, but bacteria and viruses that the Martians have no immunity against. Of course, in Resistance Fall of Man, Nathan Hale blows something up to save the day because this is an action game after all. But the journey getting to that expected climactic finale has a lot more meaning if you care to look deeper. H.G. Wells wrote The War of the Worlds as a metaphor for the damage that real-life British colonialism was doing to the world at the time. In fact, he specifically mentions this when describing the destruction of the invading Martians in the first chapter of his novel, saying, quote, And before we judge of them too harshly, we must remember what ruthless and utter destruction our own species has wrought, not only upon animals, such as the vanished bison and the dodo, but upon its inferior races, the Tasmanians, in spite of their human likeness, were entirely swept out of existence in a war of extermination waged by European immigrants in the space of 50 years. Are we such apostles of mercy as to complain if the Martians warred in the same spirit? End quote. Of course, now we know that the Tasmanian people were not completely wiped out, and H.G. Wells' vocabulary in describing them still comes off as slightly racist, even for the standards of 1898. But the criticism of the destruction British colonialism was doing at the time is still present in his novel. And that was a pretty progressive stance to take back in 1898. H.G. Wells purposefully made The War of the Worlds take place in his native England to have a fictionalized account of how the English would react if they were on the receiving end of colonialism. It is implied that the Martians invade Earth because their own resources on Mars have dwindled to nothing and target Earth because we have the resources they need, but an actual reason for their invasion is left slightly vague for the reader to decide. Either way, the reasons don't really matter because the result is still the same the destruction and suffering of the people who are being colonized. But while H.G. Wells points out the plight of the Tasmanian people specifically, there are various other real-life accounts that exemplify the destruction of colonization, even if you limit the examples to current events before 1898. The Opium Wars, England's continuous struggle with Scotland and Ireland, Europe's invasion of Africa and the Americas, and the U.S.'s genocide of many Native American tribes for their lands are all examples of how colonization destroys the environment and culture of the invaded, all in the name of stealing resources or just good old-fashioned greed. So to have the narrative switched and have a European power suddenly suffer the same kind of destruction they were inflicting on the rest of the world for so long was quite the ballsy move in 1898. In Resistance Fall of Man, you can actually see this happening in real time. The destruction that Chimera create all around you is not at all different from the destruction that colonial powers did on other nations in real life. In the game, you realize that the Chimera want to terraform the Earth into a cold, almost ice age-like environment because the Chimera thrive in these conditions. Like the War of the Worlds, Resistance Fall of Man uses real-life locations to tell its fictional story. Your adventure begins in York, but will take you to places like Manchester, Grisby, Bristol, and eventually London. The real-life locations used even got Insomniac, the developers of Resistance, in trouble with the Manchester Cathedral as it was used as a location for the game. Apparently, Catholic organizations don't appreciate their structures being used in violent first-person shooters. But with all due respect to the Manchester Cathedral, I think they missed the point. Now, I'm the last person to defend any religious organization due to their crimes against humanity. But I also don't deny that structures like the Manchester Cathedral have a lot of history that is worth preserving, both the good and the bad. 
So the thought of the Chimera destroying that history, if you appreciate it like I do, is quite the loss to endure, even if it's just for pretend. Since this was a launch title for the PlayStation 3, the graphics aren't as impressive as they once were. Everything seems to have a brownish hue to it or something. But the feeling of destruction to these cities is still palpable, and the mute color palette emphasizes the dire situation humanity is in. Just like the British did to its colonized territories in real life, the Chimera are destroying everything. The great British cities are reduced to rubble by a force humanity doesn't understand other than the fact that they are very hostile and want to take over the land. But it's not enough to simply steal the land. The Chimera want the complete conquest of the UK and eventually the world. The Chimera are erasing history and landmarks that mean nothing to them because why would they care about human history? In a similar real life vein, why would the British care about Indian history? Why would the Spanish care about Aztec history? Or why would the U.S. care about Native American history? The Chimera have the same mentality that colonizers from the past had. We want it, we can take it, so we will. Consequences be damned. The Chimera act on a philosophy not too different than that of Manifest Destiny, which was the twisted belief first coined in 1845 that the American white man had the God-given duty to colonize the West and rid it of who they considered as quote-unquote savages. When looking at it from this perspective, are the Chimera really that different from humanity after all, especially when their destruction is just as comparable to our own? The game even tackles the theme of forced conversion. As you play through the game, you learn how the Chimera convert their human victims to Chimeran foot soldiers when you are captured and have to escape a site the Chimera have converted into a conversion center. Unconscious humans are forcefully fed through tubes and cocooned for a period of time until they eventually turn into Chimera, erasing all traces of their humanity. The metaphor of real-life forced conversion was not lost on me. Back when H.G. Wells wrote The War of the Worlds, the U.S. and Canada would force their Native American tribes into reservations for those who survived the invasion and displacement of their lands and be forced into quote-unquote schools to convert them to Christianity and erase their unique Native American beliefs. Today, we know that those so-called schools were nothing more than a cesspool of physical, emotional, and sexual abuse, and those that didn't convert were severely punished leaving behind individuals who had to deal with severe trauma for the rest of their lives. Kids in these schools did not learn. They survived. Whether intentional or not, I see the forced conversion of humans to the monstrous chimera as the perfect metaphor for this real-life trauma. H.G. Wells writes about many of the destructive consequences of colonization, but conversion is one he doesn't really explore and one that resistance has the perfect metaphor for that expands the themes of colonization in The War of the Worlds. The protagonist, Nathan Hale, doesn't speak much, but he doesn't really need to. What he sees in the conversion facilities and his reaction to it is enough to know that the situation with the Chimera invasion is worse than what most people realize, and when you actually see how the Chimera transform humans into their own monstrosities, well, no words are needed. But even if Nathan Hale doesn't say much, his name has significance when historically speaking about colonization. Nathan Hale, the name Nathan Hale, was actually the real life name of an American and Irish revolutionary who both fought during their respective wars for independence against the British and both were executed for their anti-colonial struggles. Of course, the vast majority of the game is our nearly mute hero killing Chimera blowing things up before destroying some structure or contraption that leads to victory. But the fact that the game developers called him Nathan Hale is no coincidence. The themes of H.G. Wells' classic novel are still there. And just like at the end of The World of the Worlds, when the Martians are defeated by their own failed immunity, the Chimera are also temporarily defeated in the game as well. But Europe is still under Chimeran control, and the war is far from over. The first game ends just like the novel does, somewhat triumphant, but with the uneasy feeling that the aliens are going to return. The War of the Worlds ends with a feeling of weariness due to the possibility of the Martians returning to Earth, but Resistance 2 wastes no time in showing that your temporary victory against that Chimera in the first game was just that, temporary. 
The Chimera recover rather quickly from their defeat, and it's clear from the start of Resistance 2 that they are pissed. From the very beginning of the game, it is obvious that humanity is fighting a losing war. The Chimera are on a rampage from start to finish, and any small victories obtained by humanity only seem to delay the inevitable Chimeran conquest of Earth. Adding to this feeling of global alien invasion is the game taking place in various US cities. The game starts in Iceland, but you eventually make it to the United States in 1953, two years after the events of the first game. And you battle the Chimera from the Redwood Forest of California to my hometown of Chicago. The destruction that the Chimera cause is a lot more palpable, and seeing US cities be helplessly invaded by that Chimera is quite the sight to see. Resistance 2 might not be the first game that shows the US as the invaded country against an unstoppable force, but it's still very unique nonetheless, and very dreadful in the best of ways. The first time you see gigantic Chimeran ships fly over San Francisco as they reduce the city to rubble is both shocking and horrifying. Setting-wise, Resistance 2 is the War of the Worlds if the alien invasion happened in the US in the 1950s rather than the UK in the 1890s. Only this time, the US is just as helpless as the UK was in the first game. Once again, you play as Nathan Hale. After the events of the first game, Hale joins a military group known as the Sentinels. The Sentinels are humans who, just like Nathan, have been infused with Chimeran DNA. This makes them a lot stronger than regular soldiers, but it also means that they are vulnerable to the influence of that Chimera unless regularly treated to keep that Chimeran DNA flowing through their bodies under control. Nathan Hale is a little more talkative than he was the first game, and even shows some emotion here and there to make him more than just a paint by numbers rough and tough Chimeran killing machine. But just like the first game, what's important is what's happening around him. The Chimera are just as ruthless as ever, and when they finally invade the US, it really hits the player that the situation is so much worse than before as the US, the last bastion of human hope, is being destroyed by the Chimera. But this time, there is an actual antagonist that serves as the leader of the Chimera known as Daedalus. Originally, Daedalus used to be a Sentinel, a man by the name of Joseph Shepard but his infusion with pure Chimeran DNA had severe side effects that eventually turned him into what the Chimera call an angel, which basically means he can command the Chimera at will. Daedalus is the perfect example of another theme H.G. Wells explored in The War of the Worlds, Social Darwinism. For those that might not know, Social Darwinism is the now debunked belief that natural selection can be implemented into various societal factors, such as race, gender, economy, politics, etc. And the beliefs of this ideology are that those in power decide what these societal factors are and who is fit to handle what in their own view of an idealized society. Even though it's called social Darwinism, this ideology has nothing to do with actual Darwinist theories, and it's more accurate to say that those who follow social Darwinism in real life perverted Darwin's teachings to suit their own flawed beliefs to stay in power. Real life atrocities like slavery, segregation, and genocide can all be attributed to evil and misguided leaders who worshipped at the altar of social Darwinism, Adolf Hitler and the Nazis being an obvious example. In many ways, social Darwinism was the justification that colonizers gave themselves when taking over another person's land. It's hard to justify stealing something from someone you know to be a fellow human, so instead, you need to other the person so that you create cognitive dissonance to justify your actions, especially when colonization is involved. In the War of the Worlds, the aspect of social Darwinism is pretty straightforward. The Martians don't regard humanity as equal beings at all, so why should they care about the destruction and death that they are causing when invading the UK? In Resistance 2, the social Darwinism theme is straightforward as well, but Daedalus serves as the perfect antagonist to spread this sick ideology. He might not appear much in the game, but when he does, you know he's the perfect bad guy to follow social Darwinism for a few reasons. First, Daedalus is easy to hate thanks to fantastic monster design. He has a human head in the middle of a huge squid-like body that is both repulsive yet intriguing to watch. His design is actually a nod to the War of the Worlds since he very closely resembles how the Martians are described in that novel. Second, Daedalus is like the Hannibal Lecter of the Chimera. He is gleefully leading an invasion of Earth knowing full well that this means the death of billions. And yet, he is polite to Nathan, 
He even warns Nathan in some levels to leave or else get his squad killed. Lastly, Daedalus views humanity the same way colonizers viewed the people they were colonizing, with indifferent contempt. To Daedalus, humanity is no more valuable than the ants you unknowingly step on in your backyard. He lets you know that the Chimera were actually on Earth long before humans even existed and, in his mind, this gives him all the justification he needs to wipe out humanity and reclaim what was once lost. To Daedalus, humans are just a nuisance to be dealt with, and this is enough for the Chimera to wage a genocidal war against humanity. Again, what do they care about humans? The Chimera are stronger than humans and more technologically advanced than humans, and in social Darwinism, this gives them the right to wipe out humanity off the face of the earth. It doesn't take a genius to realize the parallels of suffering and destruction this ideology has already had in real life. Just like the first game, Resistance 2 is also great at keeping the theme of colonization prevalent throughout its gameplay and story. Only this time, the scale is much grander. You feel the destruction the Chimera are leaving behind as big US cities and small towns are completely taken over by them. Fighting in small towns has an especially eerie and disturbing feeling to it. One of these small towns is Twin Falls, Idaho, which the Chimera turn into a ghost town. Civilians who were able to evacuate have done so, while others face the fate worse than death. By 1953, the Chimera no longer need conversion centers to convert humans into Chimera and instead use pods that look like a combination of an inside-out egg and a cancerous tumor. When you see these pods being laid out in homes, streets, and tunnels by the dozens, sometimes even hundreds, it gives the player a real sense of Chimeran brutality. The pods make these weird alien moans when you get close to them, and if you decide to destroy them, sometimes a dead Chimera will collapse like an underdeveloped bird that was taken out of its egg too soon. It's in this small town in Idaho that messages from a radio man called Harry Stillman start to get dire as he narrates how the war is going on other parts of the US. Harry Stillman is based in Philadelphia, and the situation there is just as bad as everywhere else in the US. But Harry Stillman serves to tell a more normal civilian reaction to the war. His descent into hopelessness as things get worse is perfectly exemplified in this broadcast. For Radio USA, this is Henry Stillman. This morning, the country shudders in the wake of complete devastation. As I look outside my window, I see nothing but the cold still that follows death around like a lost child. And I myself sit in an empty booth, so you'll pardon me if the program suffers from lack of a proper audio engineer. There are bodies scattered about the streets beneath me, former friends and neighbors now lying in storm drains, limbs twisted in ways I can't begin to describe. And just yesterday, they were very much alive, being herded like sheep into military vehicles, driven by armed men in black masks. And my wife, my Beverly, was amongst those who made the last one out. And as her truck turned down 30th, I watched Watched as these beasts overtook them. They overturned the truck and chased them down, snatching them and pulling them in and wrapping them in these cocoons. And I watched her, and she watched me too, waiting for me to act waiting for her husband to run in and rip the webbing from her and take her away, but instead I did nothing. I stood there, frozen in the still. 
This is Henry Stillman, broadcasting from the city of brotherly love, Radio USA, Philadelphia. As the game progresses, Harry Stillman will lose his wife, see people die, and come to resent himself for his helplessness, even though there wasn't much he could do in the first place, before eventually deciding to, quote-unquote, go for a walk, implying that he lost all hope and will give himself willingly to the Chimera as a form of atonement for not being brave enough to save the ones he loved. Fighting in big cities also gives you a feeling of exploring a ghost town, but the big buildings and recognizable landmarks are very effective in letting you know that, not too long ago, these cities were full of life. My home city of Chicago is used to represent one of these great cities being taken over by the Chimera, and, if I may geek out for a bit, playing this section of the game brought a huge smile to my face. I loved how Resistance 2 tried its best to imitate my home city, and, to their credit, they did an amazing job. Not only is the image of the Chicago theater accurately portrayed, but you can even see one of the Marshall Field clocks across the street. They're on the wrong side of the street, but at least it's there, and I appreciate that. The trains also resemble how the Chicago CTA trains look today, but considering this is a 1950s interpretation of Chicago dealing with alien invasion, I can let that slide. But to me, the one thing that makes me praise Resistance 2's representation of Chicago is the addition of the real-life Du Sable Bridge. Today, this bridge can be found in downtown Chicago on Michigan Avenue, and its four corners are murals that show the discovery of Chicago. While these murals are important in telling the founding history of Chicago, they also show that the founding of my city came at the expense of the native Panawatawi people. One mural in particular shows American forces quote-unquote heroically defending Fort Dearborn against the Panawatami. Fort Dearborn was built in 1803, and it is seen as the structure that begun the construction of Chicago. It was also rightfully seen by the Panawatami people as an invasion of their land, so they attacked it and killed many of the colonizing Americans while taking others prisoner. The fact that this bridge is present in the Chicago level of Resistance 2 is no coincidence. Chicago has no shortage of iconic bridges thanks to the Chicago River cutting through the city, and yet Insomniac chose this bridge specifically. The DuSable Bridge murals are the story of how Chicago started its great and amazing history, but they are also a story of colonization, one in which the Panawatami people were eventually forced off their land. For most people that don't live in Chicago, this bridge might seem inconsequential, but for myself and many Chicagoans who also love Chicago history, this bridge is an obvious hint to the themes of colonization that Resistance 2 is continuing with. While Resistance 3 is my favorite game in the series due to its revamped gameplay and better focus on individual characters, Resistance 2 has my favorite ending of the whole series. Through necessity and lack of time, Nathan Hale does not get treated to keep the Chimeran virus flowing through his body under control. In the final level of the game, he is told that he only has a few hours before he is converted into a Chimera. So to make his last few hours as a human count, he decides to kill Daedalus and deal a huge blow to the Chimeran forces. Through great difficulty and sacrifice, Nathan Hale kills Daedalus and arms a nuclear warhead and destroys a Chimeran armada. But the plan ultimately backfires as the nuclear explosion inadvertently opens a wormhole to the Chimeran homeworld, and when Capelli, one of Nathan's sentinel buddies, finds Nathan, he has completely succumbed to the Chimeran virus. Capelli has no choice but to kill Nathan. I loved this ending for its dreadful nature. After all the gun ho action, all the macho man bullshit, and all the sacrifices humanity has made to defeat the Chimera, humanity loses. There's no doubt about it, you lose. All you did was delay the inevitable. I know I sound like a broken record by saying this, but that is exactly how real life colonization happened for many who were colonized. Many native people fought back against their colonizers, but for the vast majority of them, all they could do was delay the conquest of their lands. The ending is pretty ballsy for an action game, and it leaves the series with an interesting question for its third game. Where can you possibly go when everything has been lost? The answer? You rebuild with whatever is left and fight to protect what you still have. 
That's the answer given in Resistance 3. And through a change of protagonist and a more personal story, you start to understand why those that are colonized would still fight under the banner of Resistance even when everything seems to be lost. You play as Joseph Capelli one of the Sentinels from the last game, and the man who was forced to put down Nathan Hale after he succumbed to the Chimeran virus at the end of Resistance 2. However, even in death, Nathan Hale had one last gift to give humanity. From his dead body, a vaccine for the Chimeran virus was created to prevent any more humans from being converted into Chimera, without actual pods, that is. But even with this major breakthrough, it seems to be too little, too late. By this point, the Chimera have ratcheted up their offensive on an already strained human resistance and hope to wipe out humanity before the Chimeran vaccine can turn the tide of the war. Joseph Capelli is dishonorably discharged from the military for killing Nathan Hale, even though he had no choice. However, this gives him an opportunity to live a simpler life, or at least as simple as it can get in a world ruled by the Chimera. Resistance 3 takes place four years after the events of Resistance 2, and in 1957, things are even worse for humanity. As you start the game, Joseph lives in a small settlement hidden from the Chimera with some of its inhabitants living underground. Joseph now has a wife and a son, and this serves as the anchor for the entire game. Joseph was basically a badass space marine in the second game that killed Chimera left and right with his overpowered Gatling gun. But in the third game, he's a more grounded character to fit a more grounded tone. The game accomplishes this by being simpler, story-wise, than the games before. Joseph Capelli isn't fighting for glory or country, hell, he isn't even fighting to save the world. He's fighting for his wife and child, because that's all he has left. Resistance 3 has less direct inspiration from H.G. Wells' novel The War of the Worlds, but does expand on its colonial themes by exploring what those who are colonized do to protect whatever they have left when resistance is nearly broken. What's left to fight for isn't country, government, or monuments because all that stuff is gone now. What's left to fight for is family, artifacts, and whatever semblance of culture you still have left. Though Joseph eventually goes on a shooting adventure because this is an action game after all, Joseph himself is very hesitant to go. And why would he? He has a family and community to take care of, and the first level shows that the people Joseph has chosen to settle with have indeed made a community where they all care for each other. His hesitation to go back to a gun-ho attitude as seen in the previous games is also understandable because, well, what did it accomplish? They lost. It makes sense that Joseph would rather settle down and simply take care of his family and whatever is left of his community. However, an old friend, Dr. Malenkov, who was a character used to explain the Chimeran biology in the previous game, warns Joseph that unless they shut down the wormhole in New York City that the Chimera are using to travel to Earth, it will only be a matter of time before the Chimera terraform all of Earth into a cold wasteland and wipe out even the last remnants of humanity on Earth. Though hesitant, Joseph leaves to New York at the behest of his wife to stop the Chimeran threat and give their son an actual chance to have a life. And so Joseph leaves his community to travel through the ruins of the US and shut down the Chimera wormhole. Even though the situation is pretty grim from the get-go, I was surprised how optimistic the game itself turns out to be in its belief in humanity when faced with the possibility of extinction. When Joseph leaves his settlement, you realize that other settlements around the US are in contact through secured radio so as to not be discovered by the Chimera. They help each other with supplies and in finding missing people. You even hear about how the rest of the world is doing under the Chimeran occupation that come with a few references to previous games if you stop to listen. The mood is still grim and desperate, but this sense of desperation breeds a feeling of togetherness because all of humanity is desperate by this point. So instead of just hunkering down for the inevitable extinction, the picture that Resistance 3 paints of humanity is one of resilience and quiet courage. Joseph will come into contact with other settlements and resistance groups along the way, and while the initial contact with most of these settlements might be tense and even uneasy, by the end, most of these settlements will assist Joseph in his mission to reach New York City and shut down the Chimeran wormhole. After Joseph's memorable battle through the Mississippi River, Dr. Malakoff becomes seriously injured and Joseph encounters a resistance group led by a guy named Charlie. Charlie first comes off as a slimy character. 
He agrees to provide Malenkov with medical aid, but only in return for Joseph's chimera killing services. He also promises Joseph to provide them with a plane to get them to New York City once Joseph returns the favor to get power supplies that they have to steal from that chimera and kill as much chimera as they can along the way. There is a nagging feeling from the player that Charlie might go back on his word and try to screw over Joseph once he fulfills his part of the bargain. But he doesn't. Charlie keeps his word to Joseph and even returns to save Joseph in the final parts of the game, going all the way to shut down the Chimera wormhole alongside him by the game's end. A religious settlement is also portrayed in a similar way. On their way to New York City, the plane Joseph rides on comes under attack and he falls off as a result. He's forced to find another way to New York City and eventually finds himself asking for help from a very religious settlement. Like Charlie, the initial encounter is a little uneasy. At first, the settlement is portrayed almost like a religious cult where the people put all that happens, both the good and the bad, as the plan of the Almighty. They refuse to leave their land because God gave them this land and it should be the will of the Lord as to whether they defend their home or die trying. I'll admit, at first I saw this as criticism of religious fanaticism because at some points during your time in the settlement it does seem that way, even if it's just brief. However, the game is smarter and more optimistic than that. I came to realize that while I might have seen the settlement's commitment to religion a little off-putting, to them it was the only thing keeping their settlement together. This settlement needed something to believe in that would help them through the Chimeran occupation. It's like the old saying says, there are no atheists in foxholes, and this religious settlement has clearly embraced the guidance of a higher power to get them through this time of fear and uncertainty. The level itself has obvious inspirations from other games, mainly the Ravenholm settlement from Half-Life 2, but for what the game borrows, it gives something back. In this case, Resistance gives back Subversion, and just like the Resistance group you met earlier, this religious settlement agrees to help Joseph and Dr. Malakoff for something in return. In this case, a husband and wife duo who serve as the leaders of this religious settlement need to kill a huge bug chimera underground that has been terrorizing their community for quite some time. The journey to get to this huge chimera insect is entertaining on its own, but as you venture into the caves that house this creature, the husband rattles off Bible verses that make you question whether they will actually help you, or if they are really an insane cult. It could go either way. Thankfully, once again, the game subverts this expectation of betrayal, and once the huge chimera bug is killed, this religious settlement fixes up a train to take you to New York City. Again, the game presents a positive view of humanity, even in times of chaos. Sure, the resistance group might have been a little selfish, and the religious settlement might have been a little fanatical, but in the end, they do end up helping you. And in the ruined earth of Resistance 3, that goes a long way. Unfortunately, the game does stumble in its narrative flow due to gameplay choices that, while fun, come into great friction with the narrative flow of Resistance 3 and how it wants to portray humanity's fight against the Chimera and colonization of Earth. After you leave the religious settlement, your train comes under attack by cars led by a murderous prison leader called Mike Cutler or Cyrus Grissom or whatever the hell his name is. Now admittedly, this part of the game is fun to play. A seemingly infinite number of cars attack your train Mad Max style and you have to use every weapon you can to get them to back off. Gameplay wise, it's tense and exciting. Narrative wise, it comes out of nowhere, especially when you ask yourself where the hell did a prison gang get this many cars? I was able to blow up 20 cars by the time I was done. I know people are quick to say, oh shut up, it's just a video game. But again, this part of the game comes into serious contradiction with the narrative intentions of the game. The resistance group and religious settlement might not have been realistic, but they were grounded in narrative rules that allowed for realism to mix with its sci-fi elements. Those you met along the way were starved for resources or help, and if they were going to assist you in your mission to get to New York, you had to do something in return, which would lead to action-packed missions as a result. It's the way the world works in Resistance 3. You scratch my back, I scratch yours. So to go from the grounded presentation Resistance 3 was going for up to this point, to a train chase a la Mad Max is uh, jarring. However, I would let it slide for the sake of fun as, again, gameplay-wise, I can't deny I had fun. 
What I won't let slide is what comes after. Once the prison gang catches up to you and your train crashes, the gang leader, who also looks like he's cosplaying Rob Zombie for whatever reason, kills Malenkov and throws Joseph into a ditch for a battle royale where he has to kill other prisoners gladiator style for the entertainment of the more sadistic prisoners. Why? What purpose does this serve narratively or gameplay wise? The train part might have contradicted the narrative flow, but at least it was fun. This ditch battle royale thing, whatever it is, is repetitive, redundant, and boring. You can't say it serves to make the leader of the prison into a hated antagonist because we already knew that when he literally beheads Malenkov. So this part of the game has really no purpose other than longevity. Thankfully, this is the only time where the game's focus on bombast derails it for a bit until it eventually refocuses to the tone it was going for since the beginning. Once you are finally able to explore the prison, a fellow prisoner aids you in your escape and, to the game's credit, it doesn't show every prisoner as a sadistic lunatic. Sure, the prison and train levels are the only place where you actually shoot other humans, but in the context of the story, the game makes it clear that there is a difference between the prisoners who follow the prison leader willingly and the prisoners who are there strictly for protection because the Chimera are everywhere or because wannabe Rob Zombie over there won't let them leave. By the end of the level, you trick the Chimera into destroying the prison, give the prison leader a satisfying death, and free the rest of the prisoners who can finally leave and take care of their own. The final level is what you would expect from an action game such as Resistance 3, but before it even starts, Joseph finds a radio and sends out a final message to his family as he prepares to do the impossible. Coming full circle, Joseph's mission to close the wormhole in New York City was never to defeat the Chimera or even to save the world, but to protect his family and to give his son and wife a chance to actually have a life. By the end of the game, Joseph has accepted that he will die, but soldiers on through because if his death means a better life for those he loves, so be it. But he doesn't die. Thanks to the heroics of Charlie and a final insane but spectacular idea to destroy the Chimera wormhole, both Joseph and Charlie beat the odds and sever the Chimera's only path for further reinforcements. The game's final scene is Joseph returning to his wife and child as he hugs them both, keeping with Resistance 3's positive outlook on humanity even in the face of ruin. Sure, many Chimera are still left on Earth, but with the wormhole gone, no further reinforcements can arrive, giving humanity a chance to take back Earth. As the credits roll, you hear radio broadcasts from different parts of the world declaring their own victories against the Chimera. It's the perfect end to the Resistance series, and while a fourth game would have been nice, this trilogy of games feels complete as it is. But more than just another sci-fi shooter dealing with alien invasion, the Resistance series gives us games in which we play as victims of colonization. These victims fight against it, then they fight to delay it, and finally they fight to save and protect what is left after losing the war. It's the perfect gaming metaphor for the dangers of colonization I've seen so far, and while you can't play all the Resistance games as typical running gun shooters, there is a bigger message behind all the action and explosives if you care to take a deeper look. Thank you for watching.